Hello there. Welcome back to our next study of Daniel. I appreciate you tuning in. Uh, last week we were just getting Daniel into working for Darius the king. Uh, we're going to slip on a little further in that today and we're going to see how some men who did not like the fact that he was so popular and so powerful, they're trying to get rid of him. Uh, well, I won't give you the whole story. We'll get there in just a second. But let's open with a word of prayer, and then we'll jump right in. Father God, thank you so much for the people that will see this. Please remove me from it. Remove anything about me other than the Holy Spirit's working through me, Lord, from the memory of anybody that sees this. Let your word stand, Lord, alone on that. Thank you for this wonderful J. Vernon McGee study, Lord, that I can work from. I praise you for his efforts, Lord, and I just thank you that you're going to guide me through this and reach the people on the other end of this video, Lord, that they, that they will get what they need from it. Work miracles on their end, Lord, in Christ's name I pray. Amen. We're going to start with chapter 6, verse 5 right now, uh, and that is, Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Daniel was different than everybody else. At least it seemed like there was no one else there. God had made his people different. And we're called to be a, pecu a peculiar people. Now, peculiar doesn't mean strange or odd. It means set apart. Um, when Daniel was first brought to the court of Nebuchadnezzar as a boy slave, uh, he had asked for a different diet. You remember that. And uh, from then on, the life of Daniel was different. He strove hard to be uh, his God's servant, not the false God's servant. Uh, the gentleman that wanted to get get Daniel uh, killed and get rid of him said, basically, if we're going to find anything wrong with him, we're going to have to find it in his religion because there's nothing else that we can find that he's, he's making any mistakes. Uh, the only vulnerable, vulnerable spot in Daniel was he was very uh, naked uh, to the public as far as his worship practices. Uh, you'll see that he knelt three times three times a day and opened his windows and prayed to the Lord. Uh, this is a certain certainly a case of where Daniel doing a wonderful thing, exactly what God wants him to do, is criticized uh, because his good is being called evil, uh, and it's only called evil because they don't want him around. These men knew that Daniel was faithful to God; they knew that he was dependent upon him. Uh, Daniel's prayer life was pretty amazing, and it was something that was well known. So therefore, these folks are going to try to figure some way to get Darius's orders and uh, for the kingdom to contradict with uh, Daniel's worship practices. That's the only option they've got to get rid of him. Verses 6 and 7 say, Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a, f a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. That's pretty, pretty uh, severe result there. So the plot of these princes and presidents and the politicians were very subtle. Uh, Darius was a good king. Darius was a good man, and it's obvious from secular history uh, that Darius had a vulnerable spot, and many of us have it. That's vanity, his own vanity. He would yield to flattery. Uh, one of the tragedies of today is that there are many Christians, especially uh, of financial means, who give only to organizations where the leader of the organization flatters them and, and butters them up. Now, Jay Vernon says it's his conviction that we don't need to stoop to flattering people to get them to contribute financially to a ministry. God will speak to the people's hearts that he wants to give to that ministry, and they'll give. Uh, he said, a long time ago, I discovered that I'm not as bad as my enemies say, and I'm not nearly as good as my friends say. <laughs> Jay Vernon had a very open and honest opinion of himself, and that's a good thing. Um, there's always danger in being flattered. Um, I have faced it myself many times. If if someone thanks you for something, I, I mean, I appreciate it greatly. But I, I always think of Herod, who 
when he spoke in the New Testament and the people all applauded and said he sounds like a God and he accepted that praise as, as if he were a God. The truth is there's nothing in me at all that's any good except what's there from Jesus. Uh, so when I get something right, uh, you're not seeing me do it. God may be using me as the, the means, but it's Jesus in me, the Holy Spirit, that actually does what's good. Anything other than that is me. If there's mistakes made, uh, I showed up. If things go well and the Lord is blessed, Jesus showed up. So that's kind of the way I see it. So I always th thank people for the kindness and what they say to me. I mean, I deeply appreciate it. It encourages me. Um, but I always say uh, it's the Lord that did it. Uh, always the Lord. And I'm not being facetious with that or just saying a phrase. I really do believe that. <clears throat> the men flattered Darius and he yielded to it. So he drafted a bill uh, and it was made a statute. He thus elevated himself to the position of deity and prayer was to be offered only to him. Uh, verses 8 and 9 say, Now, O king, establish the degree, decree, sign the writing, that it, might be, that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. So Darius gave in to his weakness, enjoying the, the attention he was getting, and now the decree is gone out signed by the king, and it cannot be changed. In the laws of the land, once the, in the laws of the Medes and Persians, if once a law was made, it could not be reversed. Even the king of the Medes and Persians couldn't change it after it had been passed. And now this puts Daniel in a very, very bad spot. Uh, verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Now notice how Daniel acted to this threatening law. He ignored it completely. He did not do anything audacious or foolhardy when he opened those windows. He'd been doing it for years. He just did the same thing he always did. He simply didn't back down. He did not act in a cowardly and compromising way by closing the windows. He left them open just like he always did and if people saw him praying, they saw him praying. <clears throat> uh, Jay Vernon takes a sidestep here and says, I'd like to let you note that uh, he kneeled to pray. The proper posture of prayer is often a question. And I, I, he, he's right on that. I've had people uh, allude to that many times over the years. Jay Vernon says that he doubts the posture of prayer is important. the important thing. Victor Hugo said that the soul is on its knees many times regardless of the position of the body. I kind of like that. Uh, the posture of the spirit of the man is what's important. However, if you want to select a posture for prayer, and if it's kneeling, well, then kneeling is a good way to be. Uh, kneeling has the uh, unspoken uh, impact of showing that you are submitting yourself to the person you're addressing, uh, bowing before people, uh, we have no business standing on our two feet in front of the Lord unless he pulls us up. Uh, we absolutely have nothing in us worth being able to do that. And we should worship the Lord and we should recognize his sovereignty. And I think we should recognize the holiness and the power. This is the creator of the universe. And we talk to him like a, an old time buddy or something. Uh, I, just a personal thing here, I really don't like the terms o my, o, OMG or the old man upstairs. Uh, OMG, taken to its furthest appoint, appointment, is almost blasphemous. Uh, the old man upstairs is insulting. He is not an old man. He is, a, he is an eternal God who will never age at all. He is the same in the past, the current, and in the future. Uh, to fl flippantly call him the old man upstairs tells me very clearly and quickly that the person that voices that doesn't know who God really is and makes you wonder, do they know who the Son is? Daniel prayed toward Jerusalem. Now, that was the direction of Daniel's life, and he didn't intend to change because of Darius' degree. So when he went away from the temple in Jerusalem, God's people of that day were to pray facing toward the temple. Uh, today, no earthly place is preferred above, the, above another. The Lord Jesus said, Ye shall neither in this mount nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. 
That's the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 21 and 24. Now, chapter 6 of Daniel, verse 11 says, Then these men assembled, found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Now, they were waiting on him. They were keeping an eye out. They picked something that they knew he did every day on a regular basis. They probably were right at the door. They knew exactly when he was going to be doing it. Uh, the window was open, but I doubt the door was. Let's look further here at um, verses 12 through 14. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed the decree that every man shall ask a petition uh, of, of er, ask a petition of any god or man within thirty days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. And the king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. They answered, and they they an, then answered they and said before the king that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee. O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. Then the, then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. What that means is, is he realized he had made a terrible mistake. He, he realizes that in, in the middle of being praised, he went right along with the praise and decided to do what they said, and now he, he has decreed a law that cannot be reversed, and Daniel's has broken the law at least three times or until they arrested him. And now what it says is that he works and works and works in the evening, that he, let's see, he, he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. He is digging around in manuscripts and anything else he can find to see if there's any loophole at all that he can use to save Daniel. So these men called attention to the fact that Daniel was disobeying, basic tattletales, what they were. He was at an open window praying towards Jerusalem, so it would be easy to see him. This was something that distressed the king. Darius could not change his own law, and Nebuchadnezzar would, now Nebuchadnezzar would have been able to do that. This is evidence of the deterioration from one kingdom to the next. Remember the statue we did a while back, the head of gold and then the the neck and shoulders of silver, and on down down to the uh, the very bottom of it. Uh, and every time it changed metals, it got to weaker metal. Daniel six fifteen says, Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree or statute which the king establisheth may be changed. So Daniel is to be put in the line of the den of lions, and there is nothing the king can do about it. Let's look at verse 16. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel, and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And I have a feeling that was done uh, hopefully, but not necessarily certainly. Uh, J. Vernon says he's of the opinion that the king did not believe what he said. It was like one of the half-hearted things that some of us say today. We tell someone else, oh, the Lord will take care of you. But if we were in that predicament, we wouldn't be talking like that. Uh, King Darius, though, had come a long way. Uh, <clears throat> he, uh, he recognized that the voice of Daniel was omnipotent and sovereign and could deliver him. He also saw that Daniel was faithful to God. Daniel's testimony in the dissolute court of two world powers was nothing short of miraculous. Uh, his unaffected and unassuming life was a powerful witness to the saving grace of God in that day. Verse 17 says, And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, uh, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. So they put a stone against the mouth of the den of lions. Does that remind you of anything? A stone against the, the sepulcher? That Jesus was in and Daniel spent the night down there and the lions were fierce and wild but they weren't toothless old lions these were the genuine deal Daniel's lions had teeth and they were fierce this but the safest place that night just happened to be in the den of lions I think Daniel got a pretty good night's sleep down there Jay Vernon says he probably curled up with his head on one of the lions it'd be a whole lot softer than the floor and the interesting thing is that the king was more disturbed than Daniel was probably in more danger 
Verse 18 says, Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. The king was distraught. He was he really assumed Daniel would be torn to shreds and dead by the morning, if not almost immediately. So he couldn't eat, he couldn't sleep, he couldn't get himself settled. Basically, the only thing the king did was impatiently and agonizingly wait minute by minute until he could see what had happened the next day. Uh, verse 19 and 20. Then the king arose very early in the morning. You know when you're upset at night, you don't get up late. Uh, if your sleep has gone from you because you're worried about something particular, if you have not been able to reach out and touch the Lord yet about that issue, uh, you don't sleep well and you might as well get up early. It says, Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. Probably a sight. The king was probably seen running, sprinting through the, uh, the palace, heading to the door. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. Now, lamentable voice in my mind, means that this man probably thought Daniel was dead. He didn't really believe the encouragement he'd given Daniel the night before. So he's screaming out, Daniel, are you in there? And yet he's not really feeling like there's going to be an answer. Uh, and when he, it says here, and the king cried out with a lamentable voice unto Daniel, and the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions. And uh, Jay Vernon agrees with me. He said he hasn't got any idea if, if uh, Darius actually expected an answer or not. But uh, in verse, uh, let's see, verses 21 and 22, here's what happens. Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lions' mouths that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Uh, this O king live forever is actually a polite and respectful greeting in that time. Uh, Daniel apparently had been given the same assurance that his three friends that went into the fire, that God would deliver him, so he wasn't worried a bit. Uh, his angel was evidently the same one Nebuchadnezzar had seen in the fiery furnace who most people, Jay Vernon agrees, and I agree as well, was no one else other than the pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. Uh, by the way, pre-incarnate, uh, in case that's an odd word for you, pre-incarnate appearance of Christ means an appearance of Christ before he was born on this earth. So that takes care of that. Verse 23, Then was the king exceeding glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den, so Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him because he believed in his God. That's pretty cool, I'll, no matter how you cut it. That's just awesome. The king loved Daniel, and so he was sincerely delighted and relieved that he was okay. Daniel was saved by faith. Uh, remember the verses in uh, Hebrews 11.33 when it says, Who through him, excuse me, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. Uh, verse 24 says, And the king commanded, and they brought these men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions. Uh, them, their children, and their wives, and the lions had a mastery of them all, and break all their bones in pieces, or wherever they came at the bottom of the den. This is a cruel and crude uh, paragraph here, but basically the entire families of these guys that wanted to get rid of Daniel were thrown in there, and apparently these lives were absolutely ready, and they they had a feast beyond belief. They they killed them, they ate them, and crunched the bones until they were broken, uh, as if the, these people almost had never existed. It's an amazing, amazing punishment there. In fact, I'm really glad I don't have to do that. <laughs> we're going to have to stop right here. We're right at 20 minutes almost, but thank you for tuning in. I appreciate it more than you know. Uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for anyone that hears this. Bless them wherever they are, dear God. I praise you for it, and I ask you to be with them in a special way. Uh, protect them and keep them safe if they're in danger, Lord. We pray for the Ukraine. I pray especially today for Israel. Father, as a Christian, I stand with Israel. And Lord, they're in a world of trouble right now. We need, or they need your power to help them defeat the people, the terrorists that are trying to, to destroy them. 
Father, please be with the families of the many, many people who have been killed. Lord, even babies mutilated and mistreated. Father, I, as horrible as that is, and it is off the charts horrible, one of the things that has occurred to me is the United States has killed more than 63 million babies uh, by abortion up to this point. I think the number is a little higher now. So it's amazing to me that the 40 uh, children of Israel, uh, infants of Israel being killed, Lord, uh, just made worldwide news, and it should. That's a horrible thing, and yet the United States are still hiding from what they've done. Father, bless the people that hear this. Bless our nation and help it, Lord, to become more what you want it to be. But, Father, we lift up Israel and ask you to deliver them in the ways that you promised with great power so that you get all of the praise and the glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for looking in, and I'll see you next week.